Hello, YouTube. My name is Alan, and it's that time. Once again, let's talk metal. It has been a while since I've made a video, and I'm happy to be able to sit down this evening and work on a couple. Yes, I post a video every single week on Tuesday mornings, but I tend to record them in batches, where I'll make, like, you know, three videos over the course of a weekend, and that gets me most of the way through the month, and then towards the end of the month, I'll record another batch of three. That just allows me to kind of stay a little bit ahead if things come up the last minute, my you know, family member is sick or I'm just too busy with work. <clears throat> I've got some videos kind of you know, in my back pocket that I can go ahead and post one each Tuesday and kind of stay on schedule for y'all. But yeah, it's been probably close to a month since I've actually sat down to record one, but it's been a pretty quiet weekend. Nobody's been sick. Weather's been nice. Got all our kind of errands and stuff done early. So... Yeah, seemed like a good evening to settle down and do a couple of videos. And the first one I want to do this evening is digging into the box of obscure 7-inch heavy metal singles from the 1980s. Looking back on my channel, I haven't done one of these in a couple of months. So it is funny doing only one video at a week. It feels like you've got time to cover lots of stuff. But uh, yeah, <laughs> you turn around and realize, oh, wait, it's been almost an entire season since I touched on this topic or that topic. I've been doing a bunch of book review videos in the past couple of months because I did a lot of reading over the holidays. But yeah, time to get back to some obscure 7-inch metal vinyl. This one, we're going to look at some things from the early U.S. metal scene. These are going to be some very early singles. One of these bands is relatively known. Two of them, definitely not. Without further ado, let's talk about tonight's first contestant, small band from Canton, Ohio, with the unusual name of Shizgifter. I'm going to guess it's pronounced Shizgifter anyway. That's what it looks like. Um, if it's pronounced slightly different, doesn't matter, because it's a completely made-up word by the band's own admission. Uh, one of their friends apparently had a habit of just kind of coming up with kooky nonsense words and kind of, you know, using them for in-jokes among the friends. And Shizgifter was a word they used. One of the band members thought it was really funny, so he ended up naming the band after it. Uh, like I said, band out of Ohio. They made only this one seven-inch single. It came out in 1982. It features the songs To End Is To Begin and Edit It Out. And the two songs have relatively different sounds to them. As usual, I'll play some clips as we go along through these. Um, the first clip we're going to play here is from the side Edit It Out by Shizgifter from 1982. And as usual, if the intro is a little slow, I'll skip ahead so that you get a chance to hear, you know, sort of, you know, the central part of the song. But here is a clip from Edit It Out. The child in the street, no shoes on his feet. His clothes are all in tattered rags. His sandals are long on fixed legs. He looks up to you and for mercy begs. To ask yourself, is this what earth is? So there's a bit of edited out. <clears throat> like I said, slightly unusual song. Doesn't sound particularly metal, of course. It's got, you know, a bit more sort of, you know, a froggy leaning to it, trying to maybe be a bit of an art rock thing or something. I'm not sure. Unusual. It's got a little bit of piano. Uh, the guy who formed the band in his uh, bio, which is posted online, he talks about having to take piano lessons from a very early age up to the time he was about 15. So he got into music pretty early, but later transitioned off of piano to guitar. And yeah, so it's an unusual song. It does remind me of some smaller new wave of British heavy metal bands that did singles that had a kind of a similar quirky vibe to them. Uh, there was a band called Atlantis Rising, one called Avalon, uh, a few others that, yeah, did these songs, you know, definitely had you a little bit more of a prog quirk to them, 
but still kind of got lumped in with the metal scene. And Chess Gifter did consider themselves to be mostly a heavy metal band. You wouldn't necessarily know it from that particular track, but let's check out a clip from the flip side. And this one is a fair bit heavier. So this will be a clip of the flip side to end is begin or to end to begin. So there's a clip of To End To Begin, the flip side. Obviously much heavier than the A side. It's got at least, you know, kind of a cool, gnarly, fuzzy riff going on there. Yeah, they're leaning on it a bit much. Uh, you know, the band, admittedly, they weren't really aspiring to, you know, take over the world or anything like that. This was the only time they released any actual physical product. They did record, you know, demos of other songs. And some of those are available online, but this was the band's one and only vinyl outing. I do like the, you know, to end, to begin song. It's heavy enough, especially by the standards of an American band in 1982. You know, America was a little bit late to the metal party in the early 80s. You know, it took a while for bands to get going compared to, say, the new wave of British heavy metal, especially when you got out, you know, in places like Ohio. Sure, you had a few bands already up and running, you know, early versions of Kirith Ungol, Embryonic Metallica. You know, those things were on the map, you know, in, you know, late 82. But in a lot of places, they were still drawing on other influences. Uh, metal hadn't really taken over the U.S. necessarily in 82, the way it was starting to elsewhere. You know, you already had, you know, huge bands in the U.K. And Maiden does Number of the Beast, Priest does Screaming for Vengeance. America does shiz gifter. But yeah, it's a fun uh, single for sure. And a more serious note, yeah, in America, you got Metal Massacre Volume 1, the first ever thing that Metal Blade put out. So yeah, America had a little catching up to do. We got there pretty fast. Anyway, a few other just little things about this single. Uh, the first copies of this turned up probably, I want to say it was around 2009-ish, 2008, somewhere there in the late aughts. Um, the first copy that anyone was aware of coming up for auction sold for a lot of money. It went to one of the big European collectors. Um, this was the second copy that turned up for auction. The copies, you know, had some sound clips with them. I really liked, you know, the two end to begin clip. And so yeah, I got way, way, way priced out on the first copy that uh, came around. But yeah, I was able to win the second copy. Now, a few years after that, uh, a couple of guys I know that are into these kind of obscure U.S. metal singles, they were able to track down one of the band members. I'm pretty sure it was uh, Dan Heller, the lead guitarist and guy who created the band, came up with the name and all that. And he had a handful of copies left that he sold to them, you know, and they've, you know, sold to other collectors. According to Dan's online notes, he sold them 18 copies and kept a couple for himself. So out of the 20 copies he had total. So that means, you know, there was about, you know, 20 copies that came out of the woodwork there between like, you know, the late 20, uh, 2000s and the early 20 aughts. I want to say those other 18 copies came out of the woodwork maybe around 2011 or 2012 timeframe. That did help bring the price way down on this single. I've actually owned a second copy of it. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a funny story behind that, but I won't go into the details on it. Uh, but yeah, so I owned a second copy and later sold it to another collector. 
uh, who still wanted a copy and didn't get in on it beforehand. So it's a decent single. People enjoy it. But yeah, the price is way down. I don't think there are any copies currently listed on Discogs. The price on Discogs reflects the you know, sort of you know post-18 copies coming out, where a lot of the times it sells for maybe like in the 40-ish dollar range. And that probably feels about fair. You know, it's the picture sleeve. It does have a picture sleeve. Those tend to add to the collectability, but this is a very simple one. Just a logo, some information about the band. And as you saw when I turned it over earlier, the backside is completely blank. This was a pretty small, low-budget kind of single. But a cool one. I get it if people aren't into the A-side. It's not my favorite, uh, I'll readily admit. Uh, but yeah, I think you know the B-side you know, rocks just hard enough that I can dig it. All right, so let's move on from Shiz Gifter. Oh, and just as a well, a final note, I will post a link to Dan Heller's sort of autobiography online. He gives a lot of details about you know his musical background and the band's history, and there are links to some of the other demo songs that you can listen to there for free, assuming they are still working when you check them out. But yeah, it's a fairly interesting read if you like hearing about you know these very small time bands and you know kind of what was going on in their minds as they put these bands together all right next up we're actually going to rewind a couple of years um we're staying in the US but 82 uh things were starting to happen a little bit by 82 we're going back to 1980 for this next single so very early in the decade this is one by a Pittsburgh band called Wizard so, relatively generic name. There's been a lot of wizards in music, not just in heavy metal. But yeah, this one uh, pairs the tracks Down From Under on one side with Apostle of Greed on the flip side. So, let's go to the clips, and we'll start with a bit of Down From Under by Pittsburgh's Wizard. <laughs> So there's a bit of one side from Wizard that's down from under. Uh, a kind of primitive sounding track, but fairly cool and notably heavy for 1980 in the U.S. scene. You had to kind of scratch around to find heavier albums from the U.S. in 1980. There are some, you know, the Rods, of course, were on the scene. That's probably the heaviest one that uh, I can think of off the top of my head from 1980. And there are some other bands operating, but yeah, you know, we weren't having a new wave of American heavy metal explosion in 1980 the way that the UK was. But yeah, cool, kind of crunchy, a bit of a fuzzy guitar tone to it. Uh, nice riff. It's heavy enough. It's simple. Yeah, they're repeating it a lot. Who cares? It, it works quite well. If you like music, heavy music from this era, you know, that one works quite nicely. Let's see how the flip side does. The flip side is called Apostle of Greed. Thank you. 
right. So there's some of a puzzle of greed from Wizard. So once again, you know, kind of, you know, a heavy, slightly you know, fuzzed out, twitchy guitar sound, which I can dig it. The song does have a little bit of a bouncy structure to it, which you know, feels a little odd. I'm not really a huge fan of songs to go with that really bouncy kind of rhythm, uh, but I like the guitar tone. I will still give it a thumbs up, even if it does bounce around just a little bit. <clears throat> not much else to say about Wizard. I've never heard any details about this group. As far as I know, this is the only thing they ever committed to vinyl. Uh, it's always been sort of a relatively hard single to find. You know, this one usually will sell a little bit higher. It's you know, one of those you probably would have to expect to pay around three figures for it. Yeah, but hey, it's also very nondescript. It never came with a picture sleeve. So if you can dig around in boxes of singles, this is also probably the kind of thing you could find that would be relatively cheap if someone's just got a box of generic singles and they're only a few bucks each. There's nothing that really makes this look like it's something that you know would often sell for you know closer to the hundred dollar mark. Another cool single from the earliest days of heavy metal developing in the U.S. in the 1980s, at least. Of course, you know metal kind of shifts gears when we move from the 70s to the 80s. Um, you had American bands playing metal much earlier than this, but more in the 70s style <clears throat> and the 80s style. Bands like Wizard and Shiz Gifter, they were operating in those first few years in the decade. That's one of the things that, you know, I find very endearing about these bands. No, they never went on to fame and fortune. No, they're not necessarily top-notch musicians that, you know, wrote eternal classics that everyone is going to sing for the next 100 years. But these are the bands that were operating in those very, very early years when metal was making its way through, you know, a very fundamental change and spreading across a continent. So kind of cool. I like that historical element to it. All right, our third and last band for the night. This is the one band that has some name recognition. This they started out in Tennessee, later relocated to California. Because metal bands in Tennessee, yeah, you probably gotta relocate somewhere, especially in the early 80s. Uh, this is the band Steeler. Uh, this is their 1982 single that features Cold Day in Hell and Take Her Down. So Let's start with a clip from Cold Day in Hell and see what Tennessee's Steeler sounded like in 1982. So yeah, Cold Day in Hell. Again, fairly heavy guitar riff. They're not as you know crunchy as the other bands we've played tonight, but still sounds pretty good. They've, they've got a good hook to that. The song works quite well. Really dig it. Uh, before I play Clip of the Flip Side, some folks may have thought the vocalist sounds a little familiar. That's because it is Ron Keel, who of course went on to sort of bigger things with the band named after himself, Keel. So yeah, you may have picked up on that in the vocals. We'll talk a little bit more about Steeler in a moment, but let's do check out a clip from the flip side, which is called Take Her Down.
All right. So there's a little bit of Take Her Down from Steeler. Yeah, not a bad song whatsoever. I think I like Cold Day in Hell better, but Take Her Down, perfectly representative. There's two solid metal songs on this single. It's not a one side is great and the other side is kind of, you know, something oddball or quirky or a ballad or anything like that. Um, my copy of the single also has this little mail-in card where you can get more info, sign up for stuff from the band. I don't know if this came with all of the singles, only some of them. It just happens to be in with my copy of the single. Yeah, Steeler, of course, yes, has a little bit of name recognition because they, in 1983, would release a full-length album, and that would feature a very young Ingwe Malmsteam on guitar, who was brought over, you know, and he caught the ear of Shrapnel Records, they kind of hooked him up, and so the Steeler debut album and only original album, was, uh, yeah, Ingwe's first appearance on a full-length album. Now, Ingwe does not play on the single. Again, this is from 1982. It's about a year earlier than the LP, and Malmsteen wasn't in the band when this was recorded. So, yeah, he's not part of the act there. Would be on the album, and then, of course, you know, would go on to other, you know, sort of bigger and better things, of course. Ron Keel would go on and do his, you know, eponymous band, so, but Steeler, yeah, you know, kind of has that footnote in history for being the band that kind of helped get Ingwe started in the United States. So, yeah, there you have it. Three, you know, you know, cool underground heavy metal singles from the very early 80s American heavy metal scene. A little thing I wanted to comment on, and I've meant to say this in a couple of other videos on these U.S. singles, and it always slips my mind. Uh, with some of these singles, I play mp3s from the single itself because i can rip some of these to uh, my computer others however i do play mp3s that other people sent me once upon a time you know some of these things i first heard like through cdr trading uh, and stuff like that and people you know have also would send me have sent me download links for some singles so if you hear me play an mp3 and you're like that particular take sounds exactly like the mp3 i made it could be uh i'm pointing out in particular with reference to the clips i played from wizard tonight you know there is some static and crackle there i don't think i made those wizard mp3s to be clear those mp3s are not from the copy i was showing a lot of times when i get the single i will re-record the mp3s i haven't got around to doing it with every single in my collection so yeah if somebody's sitting there thinking wait a second I think that guy on YouTube just played the uh, my ripped version of Wizard. Okay, I may have. Feel free to leave a comment down below and say that, yeah, I'm the one who created that. i uh, be glad to acknowledge that. Just wanted to make it clear that, yeah, sometimes the MP3s are coming from my personal copy. Most of them do, but there are exceptions to that. Uh, just want to be clear and give credit where it's due if somebody else did the original rip um, that I've been playing because I did get a lot of those singles from other folks back in the days of when trading was a lot more common for this stuff. Anyway, I have carried on enough. So now let's talk metal in the comments down below. What do you think of these three singles? Maybe not quite your cup of tea. Some of this very early stuff, I understand it's not heavy enough for people approaching metal with more modern sensibilities. It, this doesn't sound like Lorna Shore. It doesn't sound like Morbid Angel or anything like that. But, you know, again, I think there's something, you know, first off, good about what they're doing. I like these songs. If I didn't, I wouldn't have tracked down the singles and added them to my collection. But I also think there's something kind of just, you know, interesting and important from a historical note. Even though none of these bands, you know, go on to be the next Metallica or Megadeth or, you know, give rise to the birth of death metal, they still you know, played a role in the early American heavy metal ecosystem in the 1980s. And to me, it's just a very interesting period. I like checking out what these bands were trying to do. So leave a comment below if you liked them, if you didn't. If you have any more information about Pittsburgh's Wizard, be interesting to know a few more details about them, for example. And again, I'll include the link to the Shizgifter bio written by Dan Haller so that you can read more about that band and check out some of their demo tracks if you're interested. That's going to do it for this video. So until next time, everybody take care. And as always, keep banging your head.